So we appreciate your prayers. Looking at Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Matthew chapter 5. We are uh, looking at the last half of the Beatitude of the Peacemakers. So uh, Matthew chapter 5, actually verse 9, will be the uh, passage that we are uh, attempting to uh, look at and deal with. Uh, Someone is always uh, calling us names. Uh, Someone said, I don't care what you call me, just so you call me for supper. Uh, When we were kids, we used the phrase, uh, sticks and stones may bruise my bones, but names will never hurt me. That was the way we handled all the criticism and the names that came our way. We got a little older, of course, and we then began to look at people who called us names and said, "Uh, consider the source. And we got a little older yet, and uh, we continued to say things like, uh, takes one to know one. And it was all about name calling. Boy, do I have something to tell you this morning. God is calling you names. (laughs) The amazing thing about God calling you names is that we have discovered he is absolutely good. And that if he's going to say something about you and call you a name, (laughs) it'll be a good one. And there's not a critical bone in his body and there's not a critical thought in his mind and there's, it's never a downer and it's never a finger wagged in your face and it's never a criticism and it's never... And, and the amazing thing about it is he knows you better than anyone else knows you and he still says good things about you. That is absolutely mind-boggling. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he still says good things about you. It's interesting that Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 began his whole book with that concept. And he used the word blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The word blessed there isn't the same as it is in uh, the uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Uh, Our word here is makurios, but the word there is the word we get eulogy from. means to speak good things. And he actually uses it three times. Did you recognize that? Blessed, there it is, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, blessed us. There it is again with every spiritual blessing. There it is again in the heavenly places in Christ. It's used three times. He uses it as an adjective the first time. Blessed be God, which means it's modifying God, which means God is a God who speaks good things because that's what the word means. So God is a God who's characterized by speaking good things. And if you can see God, he's sitting here, and out of him is emanating this state. Out of him is flowing this good thing. Out of this is flowing this nature of holiness and righteousness towards you. Out of this is flowing all the good things he wants you to have. Out of him is flowing these good spirits speakings and then he goes on and uses the word as a verb and says blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us he's actually now formulating these into a sentence and he's actually speaking these things about you and one of the things we know about God more than anything else is that God is creative in his speaking and when he said something whoo It is, brother. So if God is saying, calling you a good name, you can be rest assured it's coming to pass. It is there in all of its fullness. And all the good things God is speaking about you are literally rolling themselves together into one thing. In fact, he calls that, and the next time he uses the the, uh, word, he calls it, he uses it as a noun, and he calls it every spiritual blessing. So the picture is God is sitting here and out of him he's spilling all of this good stuff, all of these good things that are rolling in his mind and his heart and he's speaking them into existence. He's literally talking them, literally calling you these names and they're literally being formulated and every good spiritual blessing that God has ever wanted you to have has literally come into existence. And if you say, good night, where are they all? I'd like to have them. Woo, they're in Jesus, he says. So Jesus is the, is the package. Jesus is the, is the, 
not the warehouse. Jesus is, he hadn't stored them in him. Jesus is the essence of every good thing God wants you to have. And it's all come into existence in the person of Christ. Jesus in himself is the blessing. So in the person of Jesus Christ, God has literally spoken all he's dreamed you to be, which is why we constantly refer to him as the prototype. He's the first one. He's exactly what God has dreamed, the character he has, the way he handles himself, the way he thinks, the way he responds, his, his emotional makeup, the very essence of how he is, the very nature of his being, all that's found in Jesus is exactly what God has dreamed and destined you to be and is forming you into the very image of Jesus himself. Wow. It's mind-boggling, isn't it? In fact, Paul was so strong on this he says things like the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs. And if we're heirs of God, we are then joint heirs with Christ. In fact, Paul goes on to say we are called his brethren because we come from the same life seed, Jesus and if you were going to wrap that all up into one phrase and you were going to put it into one, one dynamic statement, what, what would you call all of that? He says you would call it sons of God, which is exactly what he does in verse 9 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. It's the climax of all that God has dreamed of for you, sons of God. One of the things that spills out of that immediately is that if God is calling us sons of God, we know it's a position of honor. I want to start with that. A position of honor. Wow. A position of honor. You are distinguished, honored, elevated. You notice that, in, and if you responded like I did, the minute I got that thought, I went back to the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we've been hounding you about that. The poor in spirit is absolutely helpless. The poor in spirit is the worst word you could use for poverty stricken with no resource at all. So you are absolutely helpless. So I've been standing up here talking to you day, uh, Sunday after Sunday about how helpless you are, how you're such a loser. Yeah, you just, wow. And, and now you try to say I'm some big shot and have an honored position called sons of God. Well, that's the whole point, see. I'm totally, absolutely helpless. I'm not helpless because I, I did the wrong thing and got in that position. I'm not helpless because once I was, I had all the resource I need and now I've blown it big time and here I am. No, I'm helpless because God made me that way. I'm supposed to be helpless so that his unlimited resource of his person could embrace me, and that would form the kingdom. And the kingdom is made up of what? Sons of God. So evidently, this helplessness and the embrace of his overwhelming resource is what makes me, it's the, it's the energy, it's the aliveness, it's the, it's the DNA, it's the very flow of life that makes me son of God. So actually, he's He's starting right back where he began, that we, are, we have somehow been embraced by the wonder of the God himself who is unlimited in his resource and in our helplessness. And in that marriage, we have become in this honored position, kingdom of God. Well, I thought I was in a state of mourning, and, and it's a very strong word, weeping. And, and yes, because, see, that's the constant response that you have to have if you're going to stay in his embrace. And I constantly recognize my helplessness. I never get to the place where I say, oh, I'm in the honored position now. No, I constantly see my helplessness. And in that morning state of recognizing that, that's what allows the comfort to come and embrace me. And I live in this embrace. And in the embrace of the comforter, I find myself in this position of honor, sons of God. Of course, that releases this embrace, releases the very nature of God, which is meekness, meekness. It's how he is. 
I find this overwhelming strength that allows me to be meek. And oh, it begins to, I begin to relate to my physical world, my, my actually f- my flesh, my physical surroundings in a way that's way beyond anything I've ever dreamed before. And it all comes out of this embrace and this mourning and this, oh, this high position. Of course, I'm hungering and thirsting after him because he, he's just, He's just, oh, the marvel of it is just so. And the more I experience him, the more I want him. And the more I want him, the more I get him. And the more I get him, the more I want him. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just expanding in my capacity. I'm just growing spiritually fat. (laughs) In this fullness and embrace of his person, in this honored position of, of being one with him, it's so It's so phenomenal and I'm living in this state of mercy because I recognize the only way I got here is the overwhelming mercies of God that have just bathed me constantly in this embrace that I do not deserve because I'm helpless and yet he made me that way. And how do you explain all that, that that uniting and all the purity of heart I just experience purity of heart and victory over sin and how how does this righteousness become mine when it's not really mine it's his and yet it's become mine and it's so integrated into my system that I take ownership of it and yet I don't own it because I never produced any of it it's this embrace of this honored position that I have with him and and oh I live in a state of peace that literally spills in and through my very being and and, and th- in this honored position, and, and how would you describe that position? What would you call that position? He says, you're being called sons of God. So you see, this is somehow the climax, not, not climax. This is somehow the thrust. This is somehow the thread. This is somehow the heartbeat. This is somehow the essence of every single one of the Beatitudes We're just rehashing, going over the same material with different words, saying the same thing about, oh, the embrace, sons of God. I meant to say when I started all this that ladies don't be upset. We're including you. This is a term that means daughters as well. We'll make it mean that because you are included. So this is... This is unity. This is oneness with his being. It's interesting. The Greek word that's used here for sons is the Greek word krios. And there's another word that probably needs to be dealt with, which is the word children. And it's the word tekon. And the word technon is, uh, which is translated children, they're sometimes krios, sons, and children are used interchangeably and and. And rightly so, but there is a distinction between the two. And the reason you know there is a distinction between these two categories of son, a son and a child, or sons and children, the reason you know there's a distinction is because Jesus is never called the child of God. That tells you something. Jesus is never called the child of God. He's always called the son. So there is a distinction that can be made between the two, and I think that needs to be made to understand this passage correctly. The whole idea of sons of God literally is an honored position. It, it focuses on, if I could communicate this, it focuses on the idea of, of the honor and the dignity that comes because of the position you have in relationship to your father, which is really significant. Child is a word that's used in terms of affection. For instance, a man would stand up and say, these are all my children. Sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? These are all my children, Uh, which is, hey, yeah, all of them. There's no honored position. But you see, when you wrap your arm around and say, ah, this is my son. See, there's, you're distinguishing. You're, 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 you're setting apart. You're, you're lifting up. You're, you're honoring. You're, see, there's an honor in all of that that's, that's over and above the affection you have for a child. That's important. 
When you say children in the New Testament, for instance, uh, there's a verse that uh, comes to us in John 1, 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become technon, children of God, to those who believe in his name. See, the word children, their focus is on origin. Did you see it? it? It's in the context of the verse. You've received him, and now you've had the right to become, come into the status of a child. You, this is origin stuff. But the word son is not, doesn't focus on origin. Again, these overlap, but it doesn't focus on origin. The word son has the idea of the fellowship of life that somehow I'm a son, meaning I... I have the DNA, I have the flow of life, I have the interconnection with, I have the nature of, I'm, 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 literally, I'm literally connected. See, I, I have this nose that looks like his. I, have, I, have, I walk like that guy there. I, 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 I'm about as tall as that guy there. I have the face features of that guy right there. I, I have the same attitudes that he has. I, I, I have a connection, a life flow, a fellowship of life. Son. God, oh, God is calling you that. This is not, oh God, how many children do you have? Well, count them for yourself. This is, oh, son, son. Got his nose. Skin coloring's the same. Got his hair. I wear what he wears. <laughs> I walk like him. Son. Now that same emphasis that we've just given you, it's not only found contained in the word, but it's contained also in the idea that there's no article in the Greek language and I wanted to point that out to you in verse 9. For they shall be called sons of God. There's no article, V, before the word sons. Could be. Sometimes there is. In other words, it could read, for they shall be called the sons of God. But that's not the way it is. The article is distinctly left off. Now, some translations that you can find put the article there but it's not there. The Bible scholars tell us that when the article is used before the word, it emphasizes, before the word sons, it emphasizes again the idea of origin. In other words, if he had said, they shall be called the sons of God, it would be emphasizing that we are coming from, produced out of, it would focus on the birth process of being a son, that we were born out of, but leaving it out, expands it to tell us that we literally are in the fellowship of the life of the Father, that we share his very life, which, oh, my dear friend, is the flow of the entire Beatitudes, that we are literally sharing his life. And I know we go over this so much, so I'm not going to go through it again, but the poor in spirit, I'm embraced by his unlimited resource. I'm sharing his life. I'm mourning and I'm embraced by the comforter. I'm sharing his life. The reason I'm in mercy is because the merciful one, I'm sharing his life. I have purity of heart. Why? Because I'm sharing his heart. I'm a peacemaker. Why? Because I'm sharing his life. And in this sharing, in the intimacy of the sharing, in the fellowship of his life, so the whole emphasis here is God is saying, oh, you guys, you, you're, you're in an honored position. I'm sharing my life with you. The fellowship of life. Another place, this same emphasis, I'm trying to convince you that's what this passage is saying. Not only is it found in the word son, and not only it is found when the article isn't present, but it's also found in the word order. And I know some, some of you don't like this kind of thing, but bear with me this, because I love it. <laughs> he starts out with the idea of for, which is the Greek word which tells us the reason of. So, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, congratulations, you peacemakers, he said. Congratulations, you peacemakers. 
Well, you look at him and say, why are you congratulating me? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. And he starts with four. Four, here's the reason why I'm giving you congratulations. You are fortunate. Here's the reason why you are fortunate. And the next word in the passage is they, in the Greek passage, is they, which is distinctly there. It's the autos word. It's the, in the nominative, which is all about the subject idea. And it, so he says, he uses the idea of they. And again, it's an extension of this, of this whole position thing. They, and it's an intensive pronoun which is significant because it literally is the idea of yourself so you could you could you could translate it you yourself is the idea and then he goes on and gives us the word son which is also in the nominative which obviously is an antecedent or however you want to look at that so the nominative is given in the they the nominative is get the subject is given in the sons and then he gives the word god which is in the genitive which shows relationship and then the verb is shall be which is uh kalo uh it shall be called which is kalo and in kalo of course at the end is the is the pronoun they which is given then the subject again so if you followed me at all it doesn't matter whether you did or not i'm going to tell you what it means they all, it means the subject is there three times. <laughs> they, 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 uh, start over. They, sons, and they. And it's given there three distinct times, which is a, such a focus that I don't know how you even translate something like that. But here's an attempt. Congratulations. Whacking you on the back. Congratulations, you peacemakers, for you yourselves, you yourselves, you yourselves are sons of God, and you shall be called this by God, which is such a position. It's like God is standing back saying, whoa, there, there he is, man. There, there, that guy right there, he, he, I'm elevating him. I'm honoring him. I'm showering him with this great position of being. He, he's my, this is my son. He walks like I walk. He, man, this boy thinks like I think. This boy has going on in him what's going on in me. This boy has my emotional makeup. This boy has my tendencies. This boy has my temperament. This, this boy here, man, he has my mind. He, 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 he's learned at my feet. This boy here has the shape of my nose. He bears my image. This, this is my son. If you were discouraged, you shouldn't be now. That's you. Well, preacher, I don't, I don't feel like that. Oh, congratulations, you're poor in spirit. You're poor in spirit. Keep that feeling. I don't feel worthy, preacher. Oh, keep that feeling. That's a part of the morning that you walk around all the time saying, whoa, whoa, how could this be? How could this be? Congratulations. Congratulations. Paul in Romans 8, 17 said this, and if children, then heirs of it, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together with him. That this is such an identification. This is such a unity. This is such a one. We share his life. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, do you see how much bigger this is than just Sunday morning church? This is, whoa, Monday morning, I'm indwelt, I'm, I'm in embrace, I'm sharing the very life of. And when my wife is upset with me, I'm in this embrace. And when home is, I'm in this embrace. And when life is in praise, I'm in this embrace. I'm in this embrace. I'm sharing life, the fellowship of life. Whoa, I'm a son. You got to get a hold of that. Hmm. 
Let me give you another idea that's distinctly in this passage and is tied distinctly in with this. One, of course, in verse 9 is that they shall be called, and it's obvious that we're being called sons of God, which is a position of honor. Another idea that flows into this is the emphasis on who is calling us that. The reason this is such an honored position is because it's a pronouncement of God. I've had people call me a son of other things, and it wasn't a, a, a promotion, you know? It wasn't a promotion at all. But, oh, God calls me son of. And I just, whoo, it's coming from him, man. This is, this is called by God. And again, if you, don't, if you don't know who he is, if you don't, and I'm not just talking about power, and I'm not just talking about might. If you don't know who he is, if you don't know his goodness, if you don't know, if you don't know the essence of the cross, if you don't know the spill out of everything he's about, and the fact that he would come and whisper in your ear and announce to your world, this is my son, and you don't know, understand how significant this is. Uh, this comes from the Greek word, which is translated, shall be called. And it's kalos, and, or kalo, and it, it's in the indicative, which means this is a simple statement of fact, so there's no argument about it. He's not presenting, well, what do you think about this, or wanting you to talk back. This is a statement. That's the end of that. Put your hand down. We're not voting. So that's the end of that. It's that kind of a statement. And, of course, it's in the passive voice, which means we don't call ourselves that, and they, uh, they, uh, the obviously what... They shall be called the sons of God. They isn't doing the action of this. It's being acted upon, which of course means that God is uh, playing the role and doing the, doing the calling. And then this word is used in a variety of ways, but in this passage, there's no question, and it's in other places as well, it's used in the sense of to appoint uh, or to uh, choose uh, that kind of an idea or to give a station to but more distinctly in our passage, it has the idea to become. Now, I want to give you a couple of scriptures where it's used in that emphasis. For instance, uh, the scripture that's used in Isaiah and also uh, in Matthew when Jesus clean, cleansed the temple. For my house shall be called, there's the word, shall be called a house of prayer. Not meaning that's a sign you're going to put up above it, but the house of God shall become, shall be, shall become a house of prayer. This is what I built this house to be, he said, for all the nations. Uh, in Genesis 21, 12, the scripture is given to us, for in Isaac your seed shall be called, which doesn't again mean a title you're going to give uh, the seed that comes from Isaac, the children that come from Isaac, but it's they shall become. This is, this is going to, they're going to come into existence. For, so the whole emphasis here is not that God is just giving you a title, not that he's just giving you a position and putting a name over it. It's that literally this is what you are becoming. Man, I thought you'd get more excited about that. It's also interesting that, and this is significant in the passage, that in verse 9, before the word God, we're back to this article thing, there is no article. In other words, they shall be called sons of God, not the God. And you say, why do you bring that up again? Because if you go back to verse 8, which is the uh, sixth uh, beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the God. Article is there. But now when he comes to give verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of, no thee, just sons of God. What's the significance of that? The significance of that is that when there's the article thee, it focuses more directly on the person of God, the one person of God. But when the article is left off, it focuses on the triune, trinity, three-person 
becoming one of God. Everybody that got that, keep your hand down. Oh, everybody did, <laughs> except Joel. That's significant in the passage. In other words, when the article is left out, when the article is there, it focuses on the, 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 the unity of the one-person Godhead. But when the article is left off, it focuses on the completeness, the entirety, the wholeness. It, it spells out the wholeness. In other words, you are a son of God. The reason isn't because the Father calls you that. The reason is because the Father calls you that, the Son calls you that, and the Spirit calls you that. You are a son of God, not because one member of the Trinity decided it. It's, it's because, oh, the Father is pouring his energy out. The Son is giving all he's got in the redemptive process. The Spirit of God is flowing and generating and fellowshipping in the life that he's giving you. And the whole entire Trinity, the completeness of the Godhead, is distinctly working in your behalf to bring you into this sonship and produce this within you. Whew. I never get tired of talking about this. Talked about it to the teens this morning. Uh, the whole Godhead is involved. See, don't ever get the picture that God the Father standing back watching this wild son of his called Jesus who's gone off on this tangent trying to redeem some stupid human beings. And looking at him and saying, good night, wonder how that'll come out. We'll probably have to rescue him before he gets done. But I'm not getting involved in that. That's sticky business, that redemption. And the father's just kind of hanging back. And the spirit is over in the corner saying, good night, I don't have time for this. And that this is some wild project of some Jesus who just can't give us up. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire trinity has bent itself to get through to you. The entire Trinity with all of its resource and all of its godness, with all of the three persons so united that they are one, has literally poured its entire, this is not the mind child of one mind, this is the mind child of three minds. Ha! Huh. This is not the project of one who has omnipotence. This is the project of three who have omnipotence. Think of that. The Trinity in binding itself together has dreamed and desired and destined that you should be called a son of God and that you should become that. It's interesting that Paul in Colossians thunders into this and says, for in him, that is Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in Jesus. Oh, I'm complete in Jesus. Well, who's Jesus? The one in whom the full, not full Godhead dwells bodily, which means the full Godhead is involved distinctly in bringing you into this. And if you thought one member of the Trinity couldn't be defeated, let's line them up with three members of the Trinity who have linked themselves together in oneness until they act as one and think as one. Man, there is no way you can't be brought into absolute, oh, the fellowship of his life. And I can't get over the imagery of the, of the Trinity huddled together in its oneness and literally saying, let's open ourselves up. Let's crack this Trinity up. The fellowship that we have, the life that permeates in us, all that we're experiencing together. Let's crack this thing open. Let's reach out with a gigantic hand. Grab a hold of Manly and pull him in. I want him in this fellowship. I want him in this love. I want him in all that I am. And he's pulled me into the heart of his life. And I am a son. I don't know whether to stand tall or crouch. Could I do both at the same time in the unworthiness of admitting the position that I am called a son? third idea just briefly 
this high position. Oh, he's pulled me into it. And the one who's pronounced this, who is stating this, who's calling me this so that I can become this is God himself. And what, where's he going with this? What, what? I mean, is this just a pat on the back? and Woo, thank you, and away I go. Oh, no. See, that's the beatitude. We are to be promoters of his nature. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Oh, the sequence again. It's in this embrace, helplessness, embraced by his unlimited resource, mourning that embraces his comfort, the comforter himself, that experiences the meekness that lives in the hungering and the filling and the hungering and the filling, that experiences the mercy, that embraces the purity that comes from his very presence, that literally embraces the peace of God. And ladies and gentlemen, the peace receivers become the, permi- the peace diffusers. It's distributed. We are distributing his nature to our world. Uh, one of the old-time saints. It's reported that his face would shine with the glory of God. A skeptic had was forced by a series of events to spend a night with him, one night with him, in an inn. The crack of dawn, he got up, packed his bags, and fled the motel. And as he was fleeing, he said, If I'd have stayed another night with that man, I shall be a Christian in spite of myself. Oh, Jesus. What am I driving my family to? What am I driving my children to? What is it that's in me and spilling through me that is shaping my world? Oh, to be embraced by you in my helplessness. So embraced by you in my helplessness. That who you are is seen in who I am. In the name of Jesus, I give you the right to tear down everything that's not like you. To reshape everything about me that's not of you. In the name of Jesus, I give you the right to reshape my face. Oh, to have a shining face. In the name of Jesus, all my attitudes. In the name of Jesus, the heart intent. In the name of Jesus, everything about my emotions and desires. In the name of Jesus, everything about my body drives. In the name of Jesus. Everything that's not like you. In my helplessness, I come to you today to be embraced by your unlimited resource. In my mourning, the constant recognition of my helplessness, I embrace your comfort that you might envelop me, permeate me with your nature of meekness. And in the nature of meekness, I would taste of you and find, oh, I hunger And in my hunger, I would be filled only to hunger more for more and more and expanded and hungered and expand and hunger and filled and hungered and expanded and hungered. I find you growing in my life. The fellowship of life. And in the state of mercy and in your purity of heart, I embrace that. You are my righteousness. I have no chance of peace. 
inwardly or outwardly, without the fellowship of your life, shape me. Shape me. Heads are bowed. Would you join me in that kind of seeking? Would you release everything that's not of that? Everything that doesn't reek of that attitude? Yes. Okay, Jesus. All right, Lord. Would you release everything that's not of that? Would you allow him to permeate the depth of your life? And while you may not be able to remove the object, you may not be able to release in surrender, would you give him the right to pry your fingers loose? Would you enter into a new fellowship, a deeper fellowship of his life? He's calling you a son, a son. You're honored. He selected you. It's calling you to the intimacy of the fellowship of his nature. Ah, altar is open. Time for response. What will you do? What will you do?